What do you mean? Or over time? So I, 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 I see the numbers and it is 29% increase per year uh, for stayers, and this is the lower, lowest, right? So the some weighted average between 29 and 37 is yeah. the national average, yes. right? Yes. So it's going to be in the low 30. I still think it's hard, right? No? Mm -hmm. okay. No, it is higher when I compare this. Uh, yeah, well, I actually, I didn't compare this with the OECD countries. I gave like this average and I compared this with the OECD countries and it, it is high. Okay. So it probably is going to be higher. Yeah. So, yeah, to get the point, I guess it would be nice to see the national average, then I see that Ecuador 29 is low compared to the national average. Okay. So, let me collect some questions here and here and then I give a Okay, please, here. Can you introduce yourself, please? So, are those only the ones that have rich growth? Because I imagine that between the movers, there are a lot that also lose weight, right? I would like yeah. to see this separately. So, yeah, because the state of the higher moments, they uh, maybe can they they show a lot of differences in the tails of the distribution. Do you want to answer that? Uh, can I? Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah, so. <laughs> I have uh, I have the large tables with this. I couldn't show it here. So for each, this is like a yeah same wage or wage decrease, same wage is zero gain, and then I have the the average decrease, the average loss, the average gain, and that's why I construct the next slide. This is the proportion. In the, the magnitude of the losses versus the the gains. Yes. I have this in tables. Uh, the next slide is the average, the, the weighted average. Construct from the tables I didn't show. The loss. Yeah, it's going to be a 30%. So we have a, you have a lot of negatives and a lot of positives. And yeah. yeah. Okay. But both, showing both. So I could have here. Okay. I have one question here. I think you already answered. I was puzzled by the decrease, but actually it's non-zero, non-growth yeah. non also. So yeah. I was puzzled by that, but really answer. Very little have no growth, no change, no real change, because of inflation. Yeah. 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 I didn't. I didn't. I know that Mexico has one of the least binding minimum wages. I don't know if it varies with the, across occupations, but uh, I know there is a chapter in the no. There's some people dead, uh, people focusing on this aspect of uh, yeah inequality and, and, and the, the role of minimum wages. But I mean, it's somehow it's somehow included in the in the formal employee status, 
somehow, of course, but I mean, I would need to, to, to have that, you know, to do that separately for, yeah, yeah. It could be. It definitely contributes for not having, uh, uh, let's say, losses, for the losses being lower in some, for some uh, occupations and sectors, yeah. Are there any other additional questions? Go ahead. Just a curiosity, because you have also a lot of wage losses among the owners, so I wonder whether you are analyzing, like, what is motivating those workers to move to like a wage decreasing shop? I mean, the characteristic of the. the jobs yeah amenities yeah I mean that's why I like the top the agenda on amenities uh, and I, I would show if I had time like uh, to show evidence on on amenities mainly health insurance supplemental health insurance and the role of this for for the transitions even involving a pay cut so yeah that's that's really important yeah The question is about how to, uh, <coughs> what would be your ideas on how to regulate uh, <coughs> this economy in which you have a high degree of informality and monotonous. We get it. So there are no unions in that sense, right? I mean, when you have informal labor markets or it could be difficult to. So, what would be the solutions for for that? Uh, I mean, what are your ideas to that be uh, useful to solve the problem of markdown and in a formal? So, at least some more. Are there any other questions, or should you? I can go ahead. On. Yeah. Um, no, that's a difficult question. <laughs> it's a very good question, but it's a difficult one. Um, and, and you are moving a lot of a lot of miles into elements that we, I, I'm not sure we fully understand yet. For instance, what is the role of unions in this monopsony power? One would expect that unions will limit the degree of monopsony power in the labor market. Clearly, minimum wages, and the literature here has been much more, you know, has been dealing a lot with the connection between monopsony power and minimum wages. Minimum wages is one way of limiting the degree of monopsony power in Latin America, in, in, in the world, right? Now, in the informal sector, minimum wages are not imposed and unions are absent. So one would expect much higher degrees of monopsony power there. How, how to go about it and what to do it? I think one dimension that Latin America needs to think very, carefully about is the, the enforcement of the minimum wage and, and, and how that would affect uh, labor markets. The degree of lack of enforcement of minimum wages, even in sectors in which the minimum wage should be enforced, is tremendously high in many countries. Brazil is one exception. It's one of the very few countries where the minimum wage is highly enforced, but in most Latin American countries, the degree of enforcement is very, very low. So this has been coupled with increases of the minimum wage, which may be unsustainable in some cases, and it's kind of a policy equilibrium, and I don't know how we get out of the policy equilibrium, but part of solving the problem of informality, I believe, would come from the enforcement of the minimum wage and, and, and thinking about uh, that dimension. No, great, great presentation. Thank you very much. I have just one uh, small question. Is when you show us the wage growth by percentile, and you show us that uh, that I mean the largest wage increases were at the the low bottom at the bottom of the distribution. I, I wonder. I mean that's whether that's just driven by 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 scale. No, I mean. The, be that they are just uh, growing by just a thousand pesos or, a th or ten dollars or so, but of course the, the rate increase is way much larger than that is a similar change at the, at the top of the distribution. So how shall we take that into account to, I mean, to reconcile the evidence that you're showing? No, sure. I mean, uh, uh, but, but that is true in any situation, right, in which you are doing this type of analysis, and it hasn't been true in any expansion in Latin America. The fact that the wages at the bottom have grown much more rapidly than the wages at the top, 
was not necessarily the case in previous shorter expansions that we have observed. So in a sense, it's a new fact. Um, but yeah, I mean, clearly doubling wages for low-skilled workers is easier than doubling wages for high-skilled workers, and it's more likely to happen. But I think it is still interesting as a trend. Are there any other questions or comments? So <clears throat> talking about the macroeconomics, you said that you were like, looking in the period of the boom in economic crisis. And actually, after 2015, they started like to collapse a bit, and then we have the pandemic. So, have you seen what is happening in the in this period of the decline of inequality afterwards? Not not on my own research. I, I've I've. You have an expert in the city next to you that wrote, I think, the most complete paper of what happened the wages during the. And I'm gonna, uh, just as Chico, who is much wiser than me, I'm gonna defer. To to her, uh, that knows much better than me. <laughs> no, I'm not going to put Julia on the spot, but she knows the, the, the story much better than me. Thank you. So my question is uh, based on, let's say, the Ricardian rent, right? Uh, when the farm size is increasing, basically they are bringing in, in more productive lands as the, the rent on the old land dissipate. So basically the farm size is increasing because the, old land, the rent from old lands is dissipating. So that is why you probably will see that um, that quadratic relationship because of the dissipation of rent, so they, they keep bringing new land into cultivation. So I think that may be what is explaining the increase in the farm side, because as they, they explore so much of the already existing land, they have to bring in new to, to increase profit. So income increase in the size, but up to a point and it begins to fall. So I think the, the, the rent from the Ricardian rent approach would be a very good explanation to what is going on in the model. And I have a second uh, contribution or question. Uh, that would be whether the people are living on a favorable, a less favorable agricultural land or not. That would determine the size. If you, for example, in many developing countries in Africa, about 40% of Farming people live on less favorable agricultural land, lands that make farming difficult. So those people are bound to be poor. So they are trapped in this resource uh, test, for, for, for lack of better word, because of where they are geographically placed. So they are poor because of their geography, and also due to the fact that they are on less favorable agricultural land. So yeah, basically those are my two questions. Maybe collect one more. I have another hand. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this, really interesting. I have two points, like more like ideas than like same contributions. Do you consider how land plays a double role as being wealth that like kind of like, relates to income in the future, you know, as a collateral, that could be related to this process of the relationship between productivity, perhaps part of the puzzle? And the second one... Can you repeat that? Yes, yeah, yeah, so if you have considered the role of wealth being like, like, like land being wealth and in a way providing a way of being a collateral for farms to grow, following, following your point in a way. And also like the role of taxation, you know, and it comes to my mind there, there, were like, there was a series of papers in 2014, 2015 from Stiglitz, that he had four, four papers and he had like an interesting one talking about land and inequality. Like that was like an Ember 2015 paper or something like that. It could be really interesting to me because maybe you have an answer. Uh, very, very important, both uh, the four questions that you did. Uh, with regards to the, to the first one, uh, about new land into cultivation and bringing new land, that is, that, that is very important. First, the, the regressions that we are, the correlations that I showed there, we are controlling for land quality. So this is not just raw correlations, but we, we have some controls in there, but what you're saying is very important. So one important thing that we are going to do precisely because of what you're saying is trying to decompose the rural, the 
the rural uh, inequality uh, through regions, because partly of that might be basically land quality that is driving these differences, which is very important. About bringing new land, uh, which was not being used before and now it's being used and of less quality, the case of Colombia, I think it's important because most of the land is, most of the land is already allocated, but you do have that process where you have the first lands that were allocated of much better quality and the, the newer ones of much less quality. So we can try to, to leverage that to see whether that is driving the, the effect. On the U shape, this, this U shape, shape that they present here, the Foster and Rosenbike, this is a graph that we did, this is not the paper, but it's at the very micro level, it's at the farm level, and they control as well for quality because it's a panel and they are, very, and they are able to control for a lot of things. So this is really driven by these productivity effects. Um, about land size, I think that's very important. We are not going to go into that in this paper, but I think that once we have all the information that we have, have all the data that we have, one second step would be to understand what determines land size, farm size, and what are the drivers of that. Uh, and we believe that's very important, whether it's policies, uh, whether it has to do with credit constraints, whether it has to do as well with other roles of land, uh, which is not only for productive reasons, but because it's wealth and it is a credit collateral, for example. But we are not going to in go into that for this paper. We're just going to be quite descriptive to get a lot of data and to understand the data quite well. And then what we want to do is to have really our research agenda on this. And, and that's one of the things that we would really like to understand. What are farm sizes so small uh, in, in most of the Latin American countries? With respect uh, to wealth, you are, you are right. Uh, and here again, we are not trying to understand what are all the consequences of land inequality, for example, here we are being very careful, we are just mentioning farm size, we are not going into land inequality, but that may have many other consequences on development and on income inequality. Uh, so we are not going to go into that, but I, we do believe that's very important. Uh, and, and we hope, <laughs> again, when we have more data to try to explore those things, but we are not going to do it in this paper. And about the role of taxation on land, I think that's a very important point because taxation can be important to reduce unproductive, the use of unproductive land and to really improve land markets. Because if you impose a tax and if the land is not being productive, basically what you are contributing to is for people to sell the land and for land markets to be much more dynamic than what they are right now. And that might be explaining uh, small land sizes as well. So yes, those are very important points. I have uh, very briefly. Do you have any control for technology or something like that, or the role of technology in this relationship that you are finding? The question is whether there are controls for technology. Uh, I use my right. speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, Maria, I think it's a great, great paper, and, and this question is not really about the paper because I know we want the paper to be scripted and lay the foundations for this research agenda. So, but for the research agenda, I wonder if you think it's useful to think in terms of the multiple market and government papers that would explain to different mechanisms why the existing distribution of farm size deviates from some optimal distribution that presumably must exist given crop types and technology. So in some, in my mind, there's a simple model in which uh, if you have a crop type and land type and, and the kinds of capital that you want, that should give you an optimal farm size. People don't converge to that from smaller farm and large farms because of a multiplicity of favors in the labor market, which is the kind that the foster was uh, but also different kind of labor market wants to do with uh, having to hold the land as, 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 as a safety because they can't move to the cities maybe. Capital market failure, again, you know, the insurance market failure around that, a credit market failure around, you know, if I'm the better entrepreneur and my neighbor, I could buy this land out and uh, we would sort it for our 
So this, you know, and then there are land market, land issues, land market failures. Maybe market failures or government failures, like you were saying, you know, tightening and regulation. So these these things. So it just seems to me, and this is a very unhelpful point, but it seems to me that what to do with these correlations will depend so fundamentally on which of these failures is affecting what, at what range, that. Uh, I mean, there's a bad way of saying this. Uh, the positive way of saying this is that the research agenda really has to move forward along with all of these questions. Mm -hmm. Just one last thing. Okay. So the points I wanted to raise at the last is the spend on this. From technology and land size. If you bring in technology, land size doesn't matter. If we have vertical farming, for example, we need technology where you can but plant size is most important. On a small land, you can have great productivity. So who cares about large land size and you have great technology? That's my first point, which I felt is not important now, which is the way in which agriculture is doing these days. The second point, which is just mentioned, which is the role of the state. When we talk about land, the state matters. And the state has ownership, and one would also say control over land. And when land is not productively employed, the state can intervene to take over the land to ensure it's more productively employed upon it. But there's no discussion here at all about land and the state, the relationship between the land and the state, and how the state can intervene to ensure greater productivity gains from the lands which are not well utilized. So those are the two points I wanted to raise. It's not in the presentation, but I would like to see how you respond to this, because this is what we are seeing here. Southeast Asia is the trends there. So now you have a difficult task of answering in <laughs> minus one minute, which is what we have. So yes, technology is very important, Veronica. And I and I since it was only a twenty minute presentation, I didn't I was not able to bring some things that we have already on technology. Um, and what you see is that the use of technology is, of course, much larger for larger farms. And here, economies of scale play, play a big role, because if you have a very small land size, a tractor, it's going to be too big, for example, for, for using the land size. Um, what you find is the U-shaped uh, relation, for example, in Colombia we have found it, is that when you have mechanization, basically the, the point where it starts being uh, positive, the relation, shifts to the left. So it, it does play a very important role. Chico, yes, your point is very important. Uh, and we are not going to go into this in this paper. It's impossible because basically what we're doing right now is really creating a, a, that data that it's going to be good for answering all those questions. But of course here, the role uh, of the state the role of markets and the role of uh, regulations for land are very important. So what we can do once we have all this data is really to try to understand this. But let me give you an example about, for example, how a land creates, a, for example, obstacles for migration. We know, and there is a ample evidence showing, that people that have land migrate less, even though wages in the urban areas are higher. And part of the, that might be partly explained because labor uh, land markets are very difficult and they, they don't move much. So people are not, be, are not able to sell the land to migrate or because land is, is, is really something that is important and wealth and an insurance and they don't sell it. So trying to understand all that, I think it's quite important. We have a lot of regulations across Latin America that are similar about for example, a threshold on land size and all those type of things, and we would be able to understand all that. And I think that is answering part of your question. You are absolutely right. Uh, we are not going into the role between land and the state and how the state determines land distribution and how the states also can create regulations for land to be productive and not have unproductive land. As I say, the purpose of this paper is to be quite descriptive, but then to open a research agenda on Latin America, precisely on all the things that you were mentioning and Chico was mentioning. Because first, what we want to do is to have enough information to go into all that uh, that you're mentioning, because that's where we want to go, to try to understand what determines land size. About technology and, and land size, I, I differ a little bit from you. Uh, you're right that technology can 
improve agricultural productivity, but there is a matter of scale there. So yes, small agricultural producers can use technology to improve productivity, but they have to, for example, create cooperatives to uh, have these economies of scale to have good technology for some types of technology. For, for others, that is not the case. But there is the issue of economies of scale there that is important. And lastly, uh, what, uh, going into what Chico was mentioning is, what is the optimal size of land? And what we find here for Latin America, and that happens also in uh, Asian countries and African countries as well, is that you have a really large percentage of, of lands and farms that are too small really to be productive. No? So what we, what, what we want to understand is, which is really the, the optimal size or, or when do lands are too small to be really productive and, and to really generate opportunities for people and increase income. That is really what we want to understand as well. But this is not what is, this paper is going to address. That would be too much. <laughs> Thank you very much.